Hello, welcome to West B Online. It is back to school time. We are praying for all of our students, teachers, and administrators. Also, we are having a virtual back to school blast for all of our elementary and pre-K kids Sunday, August 16th at 6 p.m. Check out kids.westb.org for the link. Middle schoolers and high schoolers join us for Impact Student Worship. High school will meet on Sunday nights at 6.15 beginning August 23rd. Middle school will meet in Wednesday nights at 6.15 beginning August 26th. Have you tried online giving yet? Check it out at give.westb.org. Thank you for your continued generosity. Thank you for joining us. Let's worship together.
watching over us. Whatever. Whatever he's doing, he's doing something. All of them, he speaks Greek, but knows every single other language. I can build a castle or something new, like pirate ship uh, castles out of blocks. We can build like churches and even like little tiny structures that can worship them. It looks like a new Bible. Probably lots and lots of gold. Earth. And Dad! A cloud, a bunch of people. Like streets of gold. And I think everything in God's kingdom is perfect. He said there will be pearl gates, golden roads, the whole world, and a castle. I say basically heaven, streets of gold, cloudiness. I want to go to heaven so bad because I feel like Michael Jackson's there. <laughs> I want to say to God, give me wings so I can just fly around everywhere. Are we done? We're done. Good job, buddy. Thank you so much. What if you knew exactly what God wants for your life? Would you do it? You can feel out of place sometimes, where you don't know how you fit in. Sometimes you can feel out of sorts, where you just say, you know, I don't know myself. You can feel out of bounds. I, you th you're thinking, you know, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You can feel out of order, where, where you're, you're trying to figure out what's right, but you just don't know. And, and sometimes you just feel out of time, where you think, you know, I don't, I don't know that I'll make it. You will never have complete clarity in your life, but you can know that you belong to God's kingdom. Let me take you to an obscure passage in the Old Testament, but it's a very good passage as we're talking about God's kingdom. Get your Bibles. Open them up, turn them on, get to where you need to be, 2 Chronicles chapter 36. So I'm going to read you a couple of verses. This is a passage about King Cyrus. Um, I'll explain it more here in a second, but let me read the passage first. 2 Chronicles 36, beginning in verse 22. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah, the Lord roused the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia to issue a proclamation throughout his entire kingdom and also to put it in writing. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heavens, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up, and may the Lord his God be with him. Now, the, uh, the Hebrew Bible actually ends with this passage. Our Bibles have a slightly different order to them in the Old Testament. But the Hebrew Bible ends with First and Second Chronicles. And in some ways, it's a bit of an unremarkable passage. Uh, but there's something going on here. Um, you see, Chronicles, the First and Second Chronicles is, is focusing on the good kings. Uh, because Israel was at a point in time where they were, uh, they were low, they were struggling. And so uh, these books are here to remind the people of all of the, the good things that happened. And here we have the ending of Second Chronicles where King Cyrus of Persia has allowed the, the people of Israel to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. And so this is the way that their Bible ends is with this expectation of rebuilding and an expectation of Jerusalem being back to the way that it should be. And so, in, in some ways, it's an unremarkable passage, but then there's this last line. Um, and let me, just, let me just read this to you. It, it, it says, any of his people among you may go up and may the Lord his God be with him. Uh, the last words of the Hebrew Bible call for a temple builder. 
one who will make hope a reality for anyone willing to, to go up and to be with him. And obviously, this is a reference to Jesus. And, and all the words about kings and queens in the Old Testament, uh, they're more than just a family history of the Hebrew people. They were pointing to a king of kings. They're pointing to a lord of lords. So we're finishing out our series, We Believe. And uh, we've been covering several topics that make up our eight-part confessional statement here at West Bradenton. And we're ending with this idea of what is the kingdom and how does the church fit into the kingdom of God? Let me read this statement to you about what we believe concerning the church and the kingdom of God. Here's what we believe. We believe the church is a local body of believers on mission to enlarge God's kingdom. The local church is autonomous, free of any external authority of control. So there's that last sentence, it talks about our autonomy, where it means that we're self-governing, that we don't have any outside influences telling us what to do. We're congregational in our government. But there's a greater focus that I want to make today, and it's on that first part of our confessional statement, that the church is on a mission to enlarge God's kingdom. Matthew speaks to this in his gospel in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. What does he mean by seeking first the kingdom of God? All of our pursuits, you know, the, the one at the very top should be God. And so much around us is uncertain, shaky even. Now, what about God's kingdom? The writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, verse 28, that we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Now, what is the difference between God's kingdom and the church? And how does the church fit into God's kingdom? Well, the church is the people of God. The kingdom is the eternal rule of God. And you can think of the church as the visible representation of God's kingdom today. And God's kingdom is, is a bit of an already but not yet kingdom. The completion of God's kingdom is a future reality, but the kingdom is also already at hand. And so we live between the times, between Jesus' first coming and his second coming, between the, the manger scene and, and the white horse. And another way of thinking about this is that, you know, if the kingdom of God is already but not yet, what that means is that Jesus secured the victory on the cross, but we still have a few battles yet to fight. And so when we're talking about being in the kingdom and the church being a part of the kingdom, I want you to think of kingdom worship and, and one of our primary purposes, worship. And kingdom worship is sacrificial and kingdom worship always grows. Let's, uh, let me take you to that scene where, where Jesus is uh, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and, and, it's, him, and it's, it's at this point in Luke chapter 19 when he is ushering in his kingdom. It's often called the triumphal entry, right before, uh, right before this, uh, this time where he's crucified. So he, he goes into Jerusalem and he enters on a donkey. He's ushering in his kingdom, and it's really a sign of humility. And, and why would Jesus do this? Why would Jesus usher in his kingdom with humility? We see Jesus is not only king, he's also a suffering servant. And, and it's easy to see why the disciples got confused at times. I mean, Jesus kept saying that he had to suffer, that he must suffer, and yet that he was also king. And so they would say, no, 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 you're, you know, you're, you're not supposed to suffer. Um, you, you know, you're the king. Well, he's not only the king of kings, he's not only the Messiah, but he's also the one who would have to sacrifice himself on the cross. So humble, you know, he's, he's a humble servant who works, and he's a mighty king who rules. Kings don't work, and servants can't rule. But Jesus does both. And, and when the people laid their robes in front of Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem, it revealed two very important aspects of worship within God's kingdom. The first is this. Worship is sacrificial. They were giving up their robes. You know, people didn't have wardrobes back then. They didn't have a lot of clothes. I mean, the fact that they would lay down their robe, this was a very important piece of clothing. And we learn, what we learn about worship in, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, is that without sacrifice, worship cannot occur. So this applies to all aspects of your worship. This applies to your giving, even. I mean, sacrificial giving 
is more than just the tithe. It's more than 10%. This is you giving all of who you are. This applies to our preferences. Talk about worship being sacrificial. I mean, if worship is all about just your favorite songs, I just want my favorite songs, well, then you're, you're worshiping yourself. You're not worshiping Jesus. But not only is worship sacrificial in the kingdom, kingdom worship also grows. And, and what started in, in that scene where Jesus enters into Jerusalem, you know, what, what started with 12 grows to a crowd. True worship always grows, not just numerically, but also spiritually. True worship always stretches you. Now, not only is kingdom worship sacrificial, and not only does kingdom worship grow, if we're talking about God's kingdom, kingdom people are passionate about reaching others. Passion defined is, is simply the degree of difficulty one will endure to reach a goal. What are you willing to endure to see God's kingdom grow? Because if you are saved by Jesus, then you are sent by Jesus. The mission of God is to enlarge God's kingdom. So the church exists for the glory of God, but the church exists also to enlarge the kingdom. Our church, West Bradenton, does not exist for us. Our church exists so that God's glory can be proclaimed to our neighbors and to the nations. And so the church, you've heard me say this before, the church is not a destination point. The church is a vehicle to send people out. And this is what we see in Acts chapter 2, particularly in verses 42 through 47, where the early church, it says there, is together. Twice it says that they're together. And as a result of them being unified and together within the kingdom and understanding what they were supposed to do within the kingdom, the church then grows. Verse 47 says, every day. And so you've got about, if you're talking about the book of Acts and the church and what's happening in the church, I mean, in that first chapter, there's, there's about 120 people in that first group. By the time you get to chapter 2, it says 3,000 people have been added. In chapter 4, it says 5,000 men plus men and plus women and children had been added. In chapter 5, it just says more were added. And by the time you get to chapter 6, it says the church multiplied greatly. In Acts chapter 2, most of the additions were Jewish in background. But by the time you get to Acts chapter 13, the church has added African and Asian and Jew and Greek and Roman. And so when we're talking about being a passionate people, kingdom people, reaching others. We need to be passionate, not only to bring in people who are like us, but also people who are not like us. Kingdom people are passionate people. They're passionate about reaching others. And if we do this, what this means about our churches? If, if we're going to be a kingdom church, well, kingdom churches always change, and kingdom churches are always messy. Let me break this down. You may not be, you may be thinking, really? Wait, they're always uh, changing, they're always messy. Well, here's the thing. We will always be in a state of change if, if God works in our church. Every new person that comes to Jesus and discipled here is changed. So every new person that's added is, is changed. And when God adds people, he's adding change. So every healthy church is always messy. Why? Because if a church is doing God's mission to enlarge the kingdom, then new believers are coming in, and new believers are messy. And if, and if we're honest, long-time believers are messy too. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say that there's a church of 100 that does exactly what they're supposed to do, and they do it for, for three years. And this church of 100 reaches every person, reaches one person for Jesus every year. Now, that seems reasonable. That seems reasonable that you would reach one person for Jesus in a year. Now, here, let me walk you through this. This church of 100, in that first year, what do they grow to? 200. And let's say they do it again for a second year, and everyone reaches one person for Jesus. That church of 200 then becomes 400. And if they do it again in a third year, they are now 800 people strong. Now, think about this. This church of 100 in three years is now 800. They've reached 700 people for Jesus, and seven out of eight church members are arguably newer believers. A work of God, absolutely messy. You better believe it's messy if you have that many new believers in your church. You know, I remember reading Acts chapter 10 um, on top of a cruise ship almost 14 years ago. I was on my honeymoon, the only time I've ever been on a cruise. 
um, and as I was, I was reading in Acts, at that time I was about to quit my job. I'd just gotten married. I was about to go into full-time ministry. And, and here in Acts chapter 10, I'm reading this text where Peter is on top of Simon the Tanner's house. And, and he has a vision of all peoples coming to Jesus. And, and Peter, I just and I imagine that he would have looked out, at, you know, being on the roof of that house, and he would have seen the sea. And, you know, there's this horizon out there where the, where the sky meets the sea. That's where our church is called. That's where disciples are made. We are to go to our neighbors. We're to go to the nations. We're to go where the sky meets the sea. I mean, when John had a revelation about the marriage feast of the Lamb, he saw every tongue, every tribe, every nation there with Jesus. And the process of getting them to the table begins with us today. And so kingdom work progresses rapidly by a unified church. Let me take you to one more passage, Acts chapter 6. Let me read to you the first seven verses here in Acts chapter 6. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews, that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the whole company of disciples and said, It would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenaeus, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Now, there's a lot going on in this text, and, you know, some, like me, would say it's the formation of the diaconate or the deacon body. But I want to dig a little bit here. And I want you to see something that's present in the text. You know, Luke is writing this, and, and Luke is very careful to use the same word for complaint in verse 1 as is found in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And, and, and the same word there is, is the one that's used for the murmurings of the Hebrew people as they wandered the desert. And when we're talking about a murmuring or a complaining or grumbling, what we, what we mean by this and, and what the text means is that this is, this is a half-concealed complaint that's used as leverage to get your way. And this passage, though it can be used to talk about the role of deacons, has a, has a deeper principle. And, and here's this principle. Complaining, grumbling, murmuring churches do not advance the gospel. It says there in verse 7 that the word of God spreads and the disciples increase, but that only happens when the people stop grumbling, stop murmuring, and start inviting people in and sharing Jesus. Now, who came to faith in this passage? At the very end, who, who does it say came to know Jesus? The priests, one of the hardest groups to reach. Who were these priests? Some of them would have been part of the plot to kill Jesus. A grumbling church kills kingdom work. A unified church proclaims Jesus. And if we will unify around the mission to enlarge the kingdom, God will do an incredible work. Will it be messy? Yes. Will we have to change? Yes. In order to reach people, we will. Yes. Will it require sacrifice? Yes, absolutely. Revival is always messy. Revival brings change. Revival requires sacrifice. Look at the horizon. Look at where the, the sky meets the sea. Look at that because it's exactly where God is taking us. So there's a TV show called The Price is Right. Have you ever seen it? It's been on TV for a really long time. The contestants on the show are shown an item and then they try to guess how much the item cost. We're going to play today. And here's our contestants. We have Devon and we have Brandy. And we have Hallie who's going to bring an item in. And then here's what I need you guys to do. 
we have some Mentos. I just bought these from Publix. I need you to write on your whiteboard how much you think I paid for these hmm. Mentos. All right, so they're going to think. They're going to write it down. <laughs> and we're going to see who was closest without going over. All right, on three, I want you to turn your boards around so we can see it. Ready? One, two, three. How much do the Mentos cost? So Brandy said 99 cents. Devon said $1.75. They were 109. So Brandy mm. <laughs> wins. Now, have I told you she's super competitive? Are you super competitive? I am. <laughs> All, right. All right. So Hallie, bring us the next thing. Next, we have a bag of gummy bears. All right. So I just picked those up from Publix. So this is not a commercial for Publix today. All right. Go ahead and write down how much do you think? <laughs> The marker's giving you a hard time today. How much do you think the gummy bears are? All right, ready, go. Two fifty, two dollars. They are two ninety nine. <laughs> Brandy beat you again. All right, Hallie, get our last thing. Now this item was on sale, but we're gonna go with the regular price. The regular price for double stuff Oreos. Ready? Go. Ooh, Brandy said 360, Devon said 375. Devon is our winner. They were actually 469. Like oh. they got super expensive. All right. So I think Brandy beat you on that one. Do you, do you do the grocery shopping at your I house? I like Oreos. So I don't <laughs> you like Oreos. <laughs> That's all you want. All right. But I gotta say, 469 is a lot of money for a package of cookies. Are they worth it? I don't know. I guess if you like Oreos like Devon does, they are, but you know, that's for each of us to decide. When we're trying to decide if we're going to buy something at the store, we look at the price and we decide, am I willing to pay that? Well, that reminds me of a couple parables that Jesus told. So in Matthew, the Bible says that Jesus said this, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and, and reburied. And then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. And then it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. So when, he t when Jesus told these stories, he was talking about how valuable the kingdom of heaven is. So valuable that these people were willing to sell everything. So as we've learned from Pastor Sam today about the kingdom of God, about following and, and focusing on God's way of, of life, what are we willing to give up for it? And the Bible calls us to be willing to give everything because Jesus is worth it. So as your family talks and focuses on the kingdom of God this week, what does that look like in our life? What does it mean to be willing to give everything because he's worth it? Talk about that with your family. Have a great week.